Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Chris Stewart, and I will be your host today. Let me get this moved over, and we will get going on our journey this afternoon. Hopefully you guys can see the presentation. Let me know if you guys can hear me. Correct, Dr. Howard. Yes, I am streaming on Facebook Live, and this will also be a YouTube video later on uh, my channel, which is Pastor Chris Stewart. Not a problem, Stacy. Like I said, uh, this will be available as a YouTube video later on today or tomorrow. Well, hopefully you guys can hear me and hopefully the sound comes through. We're going to be trying a few new things as looking at some YouTube videos, looking like the stream went down and the streams back up. Uh, of course, lots of fun. If you guys are here, let me know, wave and say hi. And we'll get right into the teaching. If the stream does go down, this will be a video that I will upload later to my YouTube page and then share on Facebook. So um, I don't know why there's some internet issues, but the internet is the internet. With that, let us continue, hopefully coming in loud and clear. Well, with that, we're talking about, hey, Pastor X, good to see you. We're talking and continuing in our series about who is a false teacher, how to identify them, and how to look at scripture to prove whether the things they say are true or not. Now, the biggest thing to remember, as I remind my congregation every week, Acts 17, verse 11. That these, speaking of the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, that they looked to the scriptures daily to see if the things Paul said was true. This is Paul we're talking about here, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and yet the Bereans were high-minded enough that they believed in the scriptures enough to really look at it and prove the things of Paul were true. So no matter who is teaching, whether it's uh, Dr. Howard or Pastor Zeers or me, that you really need to look to the scriptures. Not just taking a verse out of context, but looking at the contextual application of those passages. In other words, if you are looking at each of these passages, as we will today, versus identifying the author, identifying the intended audience, identifying the singular interpretation, and then identifying the potential multiple applications of that passage. Hey, Derek, good to see that you join us, but let us dive into it. In this video, in a fair use notice, there will be a larger one contained in the description. This video is for educational purposes, and as such, using Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, I'm going to be using some um, clips of YouTube videos that are not owned by myself, as well as quotations from some of Joyce Meyer's books, which are copyright or owned by Joyce Meyers. And the reason of their use is for educational purposes and for discussion and critique. With that, with the legal mumbo jumbo over with, let's jump right into it. So Joyce Myers is a popular TV personality. Hey Archie, good to see him. Is a popular TV personality that has a multi-million dollar business um, in which he pre presents uh, teachings and lectures and quote unquote sermons. Um, and we are not going to address today the issue of women pastors. I believe that is something that maybe Pastor Zeres and myself or Dr. Howard can deal with together and present a logical uh, presentation that is going to span over several streams to show why the structure of the church, as Dr. Howard's been going through First Timothy and in Titus, the structure of the church, why did God set it up the way he did? Why are there elders and deacons and what are those qualifications? Hey, Katie, good to see you. 
Yes, I saw the that Dr. Howard on the uh, potential Bible conference. I would love it. Uh, you let me know, and I will get my rear in gear and get out to California or wherever you guys are having it. Would love to see you guys again, and especially be able to edify the saints in and through uh, a Bible conference, and and to actually get to meet Pastor X and uh, just all the other great guys that are out there. As we, hey Scott Sykes, glad you could join us. So Joyce Myers is a very popular personality within quote unquote evangelical Christianity. And like I've asked before, what does evangelical really mean anymore? Not a whole lot. And unfortunately, you can get um, all different types of teachings on the internet, the TV, the radio. And uh, unfortunately, many of those quote unquote Christians that watch these things are not being critical as to what they're digesting. The Bible tells us that we need to be careful about what we ingest, talking about in eating, but also about what we set our minds upon, what is take in what is good, expel what is bad. And many Christians are not being critical in their accepting of certain quote unquote Bible teachers. And the reason why I'm doing this series is it's affecting my church. The two churches, which I pastor here in in South Dakota, there are some in my congregation that are diehard Joyce Myers fans. They have her books, they watch her her, her television program, they listen to her audio books. And I, as a pastor, have to point out her false teachings and why they should not listen to her. I do this out of heart, just as John in the book of First John is pointing out the false teachings of Serethius and why he's drawing away people to himself. Hey, Tanya Peterson and Ron Shively, glad you could join us. And also Haley. The reason why I'm doing this presentation is I am entrusted with guarding the flock that is under my care. And many are being led astray with the teachings that are going on on the internet and radio and and print from Joyce Myers. Many Christians probably listen to some of these things and just flippantly pass over them and not realizing the source of some of these teachings that has been proven to be heresy in the past and some of the new um, modern hippie um, postmodern teachings that are creeping into the church through people such as Joyce Myers. Now, with that out of the way, with my heart being exposed in the fact that this is to guard my people, I'm not here to be a sexist or a bigot, or as uh, Pastor Chris from Wall would say, jokingly, that, that I'm just being all mean and nasty. The Bible, as we looked at in our last presentation, and if you haven't seen the three hour presentation on why I'm doing this series, please watch it. Please watch it before you get into this. Uh, live stream or this video if you're watching it later and say oh Chris is just being all mean and nasty I provide a biblical response to why pastors and teachers elders in the church need to guard against heresy guard against false teaching and unfortunately in our modern era we have done a horrible job of guarding our churches and our people against heresy With that, let's look at the first error of Joyce Myers. And as a side note, I have to give a big shout out to Matt Slick over at CARM.org, who uh, was kind enough to provide a lot of the the research in which I depended upon, in which I verified and use today. Hey, Tanya, good to have you, in which is presented here today. The quotations from the book have been verified via a PDF copy of some of her books, as well as I have audio clips in which we're going to look at that are easily available on YouTube or on her Facebook channel, or excuse me, YouTube channel, in which we are going to listen together as to the context and to what she actually said. I'm not here to misquote her. I'm not here to misidentify her. Instead, we're going to just take what she has either written or said and examine it with the scriptures. 
being good Bereans and looking to the scriptures. So the first one is Jesus being born again. This is a typed out quotation of what we'll hear in just a minute if it actually works. Is Jesus was the first born again man. Now, if you don't have a hissy fit with just that description alone, we have bigger issues. Joyce Myers, in the in the audio clip that we're going to listen to in just a minute, said the minute that the blood sacrifice was accepted, speaking of the cross, Jesus was the first human that was ever born again. The big question is, we're going to listen to the clip and look at the biblical evidence. Did Jesus, the God-man, homoousius, of the same substance as the Father, being the hypostatic union, 100% God and 100% man, have to be born again in order to, um, oh, I know, Dr. Howard, I know, Howard, what nonsense, in order to obtain salvation for his elect. With that, I'm going to switch scenes here. He could have helped himself up until the point where he said, I commend my spirit into your hands. At that point, he couldn't do nothing for himself anymore. He had become sin. He was no longer the Son of God. He was sin. The minute that blood sacrifice was accepted, Jesus was the first human being that was ever born again. Now, it was sealed. I mean, this happened when he was in hell. the biggest party that's ever been had. They had my Jesus in the floor and they were standing on his back jumping up and down laughing and he had become sin. Don't you think that God was pacing wanting to put a stop to what was going on? All the hosts of hell were up on him. Up on him. Up on him. The angels are in agony. All the creation is groaning. All the hosts of hell was upon him. Up on him. They got on him. They got him down in the floor and got on him. And they were laughing and mocking. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You trusted God and look where you ended up. You thought he'd save you and get you off that cross. He didn't. Ha, ha, ha. And we are back. If you guys could hear the video, please let me know. Um, it's amazing. Uh, it was really hard to listen to that. Yeah, where does she get this nonsense from? That is a really good question, Dr. H. Yeah, what is this lady talking about, Archie? That's a really good question. We're going to look at how she claims to receive extra biblical revelation later on in our presentation. And this is one of the extra biblical revelations that she supposedly received about the nature of Christ in hell. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. But 
we're dealing with the fact that she claimed that Jesus was, quote unquote, born again. What is the reason for anyone being born again? Those that are born again need to be saved from the wrath of God, Ephesians chapter 2. Hey, Robert Ashmore and Colonel Harden, good to see you. Thanks again for your service, Colonel Harden. Once again, those that are born again are those saved from the wrath of God. Sinners in need of a Savior. They have received a new birth, according to Jesus in John 3. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that they are regenerated, that their heart of stone is replaced with the heart of flesh, that they are a new creation, a new creature. Did Jesus, who was of the same substance of the Father, who was fully God and fully man, need to be regenerated? Did he need to be saved from the wrath of God against his sin? Thanks, D, for saying you could hear the video. Once again, we're trying out new technology. And it's all, all kinds of fun, and eventually over these streams, we will get to master this new technology. Did Jesus sin? Because in, in order for Jesus to be born again, he would need to be a sinner. Where in the scripture do we see that? Where in the scripture do we see that at any point Christ sinning and needing to be redeemed just as we need to be redeemed? Where is this nonsense, as Dr. Howard would put it? It doesn't exist. She is now just from this singular presentation presenting a different Jesus. As we looked at in our previous presentation on false teachers, Galatians chapter 1 says, If anyone presents to you another gospel, hey, Robert Ashworth, good to see you. If anyone presents to you another Jesus, other than the one you have already received, the Jesus that is homoousius, of the same substance of the Father, perfect never sinning, going to the cross on our behalf. That is the Jesus in which I have received. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first seven verses, give us the gospel period. Yeah, Michael, you're right. It's eisegesis. She's reading um, too much into uh, he became sin for us on the cross and as we're going to look her next heresy being that jesus paid for our sins in hell but what she's not saying here in jesus being born again is she is implying that jesus was a sinner whether it is through imputation a big fancy theological word of him taking our unrighteousness our sin and placing it upon himself, and him then exchanging his righteousness, imputing his righteousness onto us. Imputation is not the same as sin. Imputation is an exchange. It's a legal term in which you exchange one value for another. Not as though either party actually in reality is either of those things yeah indeed dr h uh according to galatians she's accursed that word there in galatians in the greek is anathema apart from christ and we've only looked at one hey kimberly roth good to see you apart from Christ, not found in Christ, not saved. As Dr. Howard said, said earlier, she needs to repent and to believe. Just And this is one of, we're going to look at about six different either writings or sayings from Joyce Myers that prove her to be a false teacher. As we looked at in Leviticus 18, if someone comes to you with something that is outside of God's word, you are not to listen. Hey, Carla Berry, good to see you. The second thing that we're going to look at is that Jesus paid for our sins in hell, quote unquote. Joyce Myers, this is very prolific, not only in her writings, but in her some of her sermons. Uh, to quote her from her book, The Most Important Decision You'll Ever Make, 
Um, the copy in which I have is from 1993. He became our sacrifice and died on the cross. True. He did not stay dead. Amen to that. He was in the grave three days. True. During that time, he entered hell. Whoa. Time out. Pause. What does the scripture say about Jesus's mission? And yes, he was buried, but as we're going to look, what was his mission for going to, in the Greek, Hades, not Gehenna, but Hades, and what was his purpose there? Where you and I deserve to go literally, legally, excuse me, because of our sin, he paid the price there. Whoa, wait a second, once again, time out. Jesus paid the price of salvation at the cross. We're going to look at several scriptures that clearly state that. This is once again another situation in which people try and make Christ a liar on the cross when he said, it is finished, to telestai. It's done at the cross. Jesus didn't say at the cross that, oh, by the way, this only partially pays for sin, but I need to go now suffer in hell for three days to, to, to finish the work. No, he said, it is finished. This statement alone accuses Christ of lying on the cross by ref, reference and by insinuation. And we're going to look at, number one, a uh, copy of her saying this in a sermon, but look at the scriptural references for what was Jesus' purpose in Hades and what part of Hades did he go to? Let me switch scenes here a little bit. You're not going to hear me, but you will hear the audio clip again. The devil thought he had it. The devil thought he'd won. Oh, they were having the biggest party that would ever been had. They had my Jesus in the floor, and they were standing on his back, jumping up and down laughing, and he had become sin. Don't you think that God was pacing, wanting to put a stop to what was going on? All the hosts of hell were up on him. Up on him. Up on him. The angels are in agony. All the creation is groaning. I had to pause her there for two seconds. All the creation is groaning. Can someone tell me the, the reference there? What is the context of Paul writing that the, the creation is groaning? It's awaiting what? Since it's a live stream, we can have some interaction. What is it? that the earth and humanity is waiting for. You want to talk about some eisegesis. This is an example of many in which Joyce Meyer seems to be quoting scripture from out of nowhere to try and substantiate something not found in scripture. Wow, I've got 10 people watching. Good to see yeah, amen, Dr. H. Nothing she says is remotely biblical. What Paul says there is that the creation is groaning, groaning, awaiting for its adoption, for its redemption, for the promise of now, the kingdom now and not yet. The kingdom now is a spiritual kingdom which is not seen, in which when Christ returns, he will set up his physical kingdom in which the earth eventually will be redeemed. Here's the thing that most Christians forget, that the cross wasn't just about us. Once again, we go back to the fact that we keep wanting to put ourselves into the scriptures so much. Hey, Linda Archie, good to see you. We keep trying to insert ourselves into the scripture so much. Yes, the cross is, was about redeeming a particular people for himself. What about John 3.16, where it says the world? Where else in scripture, as Joyce Myers here is quoting Paul, when he says that the earth is awaiting to rede be redeemed, the earth itself needed to be redeemed as well. His blood 
purchased the redemption for the earth itself. Yeah, I agree, Michael. They try and excuse the person if if they if people use quote unquote biblical language and yet the content of what they say is not examined through scripture, people just say, Oh, well, they they're saying good things about God. But are they? Christians are forgetting the fact that the earth itself needs to be redeemed and heaven itself. Satan fell, was cast out of heaven. He sinned while in heaven and was cast down here to earth. Both of those actions bring sin and death into this world. That is why the earth and heaven need to be redeemed and recreated as we see in Revelation chapter 20. So let us not forget that, yes, the cross is about Chris and my sin being imputed to Christ and his righteousness being imputed to me, but the earth is groaning for its redemption. Hey, cousin. Hey, Mike, what's up? Is waiting for its redemption just as we are. We are waiting for being redeemed from our bodies of death into bodies of eternity in which there is no more sin, no more death, no more sadness, no more sorrow. And that is what the earth and humanity is waiting for. Not that Jesus went in hell and was suffering for our sins for three days. Let's continue listening. All the host of hell was upon him. Up on him. They got on him. They got him down in the floor and got on him. And they were laughing and mocking. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You trusted God, and look where you ended up. You thought he'd save you and get you off that cross. He didn't. Ha, ha, ha. All right, this heresy is hard to listen to. It, it's, it, to be honest, it's, it's really tough doing this presentation and the research. It was really hard to stomach some of the, hey, Rachel Parsons, good to see you, to hear some of this blatant heresy being presented by this lady, taking things out of context, as we saw her quotation from Paul, and her extra biblical revelation of this scene in hell in which the, the demons and Satan are laughing and are jumping on Jesus, which is... For those of you Bible scholars out there, where's that anywhere in the New Testament? Where is that even before, let's say, 650 AD in the early church fathers? Where? You're not going to find it. Even in the earliest Christian literature, what we call the early church fathers, nor in the New Testament is this either described or implied at any point. That Jesus paid the price for our sins in hell. He did not. It was at the cross. Yeah, Harley, it's in her deceived mind. Oh. Jesus said in John 19.30, it is finished. This seems to be a consistent theme in which the religions of the world, whether Roman Catholicism or the false teachers. Yeah, D. Howard, a reprobate mind. You're not kidding. Jesus said, it is finished, to tell us I. The religions of the world try and erase this and say that the cross only made salvation possible, but you have to add religion, the works of man, or, or believe in, in extra biblical revelation, such as Miss um, Myers presenting here this picture of hell while Jesus was in the grave for three days. We're going to look at what actually happened, but ultimately it points back to the cross and saying that it is really of no effect. It was only part of salvation. In Colossians chapter one, Paul puts a, a stop to this and says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, being the reconciler, being the intermediator or the intercessor between God and man, the big fancy theological term we find in First John is the propitiation or the appeasement of God on our behalf on the cross. 
Paul could have easily said, if this doctrine were true, that, well, he made peace by the blood of the cross and by going to hell. You don't see that in a single instance, not only in Paul's writing or John's writing or any of the other apostles or any of the early church fathers up until you get to about 650 AD in which this heresy started to be presented and represented time after time. Once again, this is a denial of the sufficiency of the cross. This is uh, what we would call the anthropocentric gospel in which mankind wants to lessen the value of the cross and to raise up his own works or religion to being equal with the cross. Whether or not she's purposely understanding the consequences of such a theology, she's presenting it before people that are in my own church. I can't stand by, just as John couldn't stand by and let Serethius um, preach a pre-Gnostic Jesus, uh, Serethius being what we would call proto-Gnostic, hey Uncle Jeff, being one who is starting to present the idea that Jesus was just a man who then became God on the cross. And then, uh, you know, the cross was only part of salvation in which now you need to add your own, your own works into the mix. As a famous phrase, and I forget what pastor I borrowed this from, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. In other words, it is either the completed work of the cross or it is nothing. If we add anything to it, even Jesus going to hell to suffer for our sins, which is not in scripture, it makes the cross of no effect. Let's continue. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul continues this thought. He says, by canceling the record of debt, once again, legal term, a column of our sin and a column of our righteousness that stood against us with its legal demands. It needed to be reconciled. You needed to make it balance. He set aside, nailing it to the cross. In the record books of heaven, recording all of our sins, it is though it, that page was ripped out and nailed to the cross with Christ as though it now never existed. The great exchange took place on the cross in which he took my sinfulness my quote-unquote righteousness, which is his filthy rags, and exchanged it for the righteousness of Christ. Where did that happen? Paul says it was on the cross. Not in hell, but it was on the cross. Peter picks up the same idea in 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, speaking of the cross, that he, we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed, speaking of salvation, not of anything else. For those of you, my friends that are watching this, that like to, to hey, Mindy, Min Min, good to see you. For those of you who like to take this verse out of context, not only here, but Psalm chapter 22, word of warning, context is key. What is Peter talking about? Peter's talking about salvation on the cross. Not as though you can take this out of context and apply it to anything to your life, sickness, um, disease, um, health, wealth, and prosperity. No, we have been healed through the cross of Christ, the great exchange of our heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Hey, Roger, good to see you. But where does Peter agree that it happened? On the tree, a euphemism for the cross. It's just, and this is just a sprinkling of verses. I had listed 12 verses or so, but I wanted to, to keep this presentation a lot less than the three-hour presentation I did on communion. We could look at many, many other verses, but this is just a sampling of the error of Joyce Myers. Hey, Raj. The next heresy up on the, on the block is that Jesus went to hell and was tormented. We've already approached this a little bit in one of her quotations, 
But in her book, The Most Important Decision You'll Ever Make, and we've already heard some of the clips, we've dealt with, did Jesus pay for our sins in hell? The evidence says no. Was Did Jesus go to hell and was tormented for our sins? Jesus paid on the cross and went to hell in my place. And then as God had promised on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. The scene in the spirit realm went something like this. Okay, hold on, time out. Number one, there's no record of this anywhere in inspired scripture. This is once again what she would call extra, or we would call extra biblical revelation that Joyce Myers often receives, quote unquote, from God to explain a doctrine in which she holds, which is unbiblical. So the scene in the spirit realm went something like this. God rose up from his throne and said to demon powers tormenting the sinless son of God, let him go. Then the resurrection power of the almighty God went through hell and filled Jesus. On earth, his grave went where they had buried him and was filled with light as the power of God filled his body. He was resurrected from the dead, the firstborn again man. Flat out heresy, false teaching. If you are following Joyce Myers and you are reading this with me, you need to understand that this is absolute, as Dr. Howard says, nonsense. Show me where it is in this book. Show me where any of the apostles or their associates ever taught a doctrine like this. You're not going to find it. You can look hard and fast. And we're going to look at several passages, both in Ephesians and in Luke, about what God actually accomplished in hell. What was his mission for going to Hades? This nonsense about him being the first born again man and being um, tormented in hell and as though God could do nothing and watch his son um, be tormented in hell is an absolute lie. And we'll look why. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, In saying that he ascended, speaking of his resurrection, what does it mean but that he also had descended into the lower regions of the earth? Now, pause for a moment. There are some interpreters that say that this is talking about his being buried the necessity of him having to actually have died in the body. But also other commentators said that this is a part of, and I would be one that would agree with them, that he had a mission in going to Hades. That yes, his body was buried for three days, but what happened to um, his spirit, his eternal essence for those three days? We're going to look at that. He descended is one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. In Isaiah chapter 61, the prophet gives us the reason why, number one, Jesus came in his mission, which Jesus quotes in his first recorded sermon in Luke chapter 4, and we're going to see what how it is fulfilled later on in Luke chapter 16, as Jesus talks about Lazarus and the rich man. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the, up the brokenhearted and to pre- proclaim liberty to the captives. Keep in the back of your mind that last phrase, to proclaim liberty to the captives. An opening of the prison to those who are bound. The last two phrases there in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1, we are going to look at in in context of Luke 16 as to why Jesus went to Hades and what was his purpose there. Was it to suffer for our sins or was it to proclaim liberty to those held captive and to open up the prison to those that were bound? In Jesus' parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Luke chapter 16, if you have your Bibles, verses 19 through 31, Jesus is telling parables about the kingdom. But he gives a very descriptive analogy and gives um, names as to 
the men involved, which I think goes beyond just a, a singular parable. I think literally that this parable was a reality leading up to the time of his death, burial, and resurrection. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So we have a dichotomy here of two people, the rich man and the poor man. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. In the King James, this would be called Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So here's Lazarus and the rich man. We see them going to two separate places, what we would call two separate compartments in Hades. There's one in which people are comforted, called Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side, in which the fathers of faith, we know from Scripture clearly in Hebrews that Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So we know that Abraham is saved and would be saved. And then there is the rich man who is being tormented in Hades. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm that has been fixed by God, I will insert, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Hey, Albert Fabian, good to see you. So we see, we receive this teachings from Jesus that at the time of the Old Testament prophets leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there was two compartments in Hades, we would call in the English hell, before it goes to the place of eternal punishment, which is Gehenna. That there's these two separate compartments. There's Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side where people are comforted. There is Hades in which people are being tormented because they're waiting for their judgment and they're casting out, as Jesus would say, into outer darkness. And Abraham says to Lazarus, or excuse me, to the rich man, you can't go from here to there. There is no way to go from the bad side, hell or Hades, to Abraham's bosom. There is no way to cross that barrier because the barrier has been fixed by God. So for my Roman Catholic friends, this extinguishes the concept of purgatory. An extra biblical doctrine that only shows up in, in a concept in one verse in the Apocrypha, which were not accepted by scriptures by the Jews, by the way in which you can suffer satispatio for your sins and then be taken into, uh, then receive the presence of God, it once again denies the central centrality of the cross. And our sins being placed upon Christ on the cross and the great exchange taking place there. Whether you accept Joyce Meyer's presentation that Jesus was tormented in hell uh, as being extra biblical revelation, it denies the fact of it is finished to tell us I. If you are a Roman Catholic and you believe the teachings of the church, this refutes that teaching. You cannot go from one side to the other. Once you are in hell, yeah, I know, Ron, Psalm 22 is often quoted or misquoted. Oh, no kidding. But it extinguishes that extra biblical doctrine. So what is it that Jesus actually came to do in what we would call Hades? Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins and to provide a way for us to once again have a relationship with the Father. While he was in the ground some would call the earth, that he descended, 
as Isaiah 61, and as we read here in Luke 16, to proclaim liberty to those held captive. Not those in Hades, but those that were awaiting for their redemption in Abraham's bosom. That is why, after Jesus' resurrection, it is recorded that many saints were resurrected as well and were walking around. So after Jesus was risen, you could look down the street and see Uncle John walking down and you're going, I just buried him last week. And yet he was found in Christ. He was as Abraham was. Uh, it was his faith was accredited to him as righteousness, but not because of any deeds he did. Because circumcision and the law came later. They were awaiting their Messiah. And so that is why Jesus went to Abraham's bosom to proclaim liberty to those awaiting for him there. And from that point, they were able to be with the father because their sins had been paid for at the cross, not in hell. Jesus wasn't down there getting poked at with pitchforks by demons. No, he was there to proclaim liberty to the captives. Sorry, Joyce Myers. He was not there to be tormented for my sins. And Joyce Myers actually uh, doubles down on this doctrine. In her book, The Most Important Decision You'll Ever Make, she once again says, His spirit went to hell because that is where we deserve to go. There is no hope of anyone going to heaven unless they believe this truth. This is an addition to the gospel. This is going beyond not only the text of scripture, but of how we understand the atonement how we understand the cross. Hey, Jeff Fuller, good to see you. She is claiming that you need to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ plus his suffering in hell for our sins. Is that biblical? No. And here is a, a quote, line by line, a text copy of the presentation that we have already seen, um, an audio presentation from her, that they were all upon him and that they were, uh, the, the angels were in agony and the creation was groaning because Jesus was being pr um, punished in, in hell. That is absolute and utter heresy. Paul rebukes this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, I have applied all these things. He's talking about teaching and building up the body in the context there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't give extra biblical revelation when being approached by Satan. He said, it is written. When he approached the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, haven't you read? Ha haven't you seen what is written in the law and the prophets? Jesus appealed to the authority of scripture, to the God-breathed text in which we have today that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. See, Paul is absolutely refuting any extra biblical revelation or anyone who wants to add to what is already said. He's saying, don't, don't go beyond what is in the scriptures so that you may not be puffed up and cause divisions among you. If you, if you want to look at all the passages we looked at about division in the church and why heresy brings division, look at my three-hour presentation on false teachers. I'm not going to rehash it here, but it's available on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook. It, this doctrine is absolutely evil. To claim that Jesus went to hell to suffer for our sins and that you have to believe that, and yet not a single verse in the New Testament claim that our salvation Yeah, I know, Ron Shively, that they've uh, accepted teachings from guys like 
um, Kenneth Hagan and others. And uh, eventually we will address those men as well. But I'm dealing with Joyce Meyer specifically because people in my church, in which I am entrusted to guard, follow her blindly. Many may not even know her teachings on these particular doctrines. And that's why I am opening it up and exposing it according to the scripture. Today is not about what Chris says or thinks. And I think in a lot of things about Joyce Myers. But we're looking at what she teaches and evaluating that according to the scriptures. Joyce Myers also teaches that we are little gods. Let's go back to YouTube and take a listen to a presentation of Joyce Myers about us being little gods. And, you know, I was listening to a set of tapes by one man, and he explained it like this, and I think this kind of gets the point across. He said, you know, why do people have such a fit about God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods? If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in His image? And you know, I was listening to a set of tapes by one man, and he explained it like this, and I think this kind of gets the point across. He said, you know, why do people have such a fit about God calling His creation, His creation, His man, not His whole creation, but His man, little gods? If He's God, what's He going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created? Doesn't the Bible say that we are created in His image and after His likeness? Where in Scripture does it say that we are gods or that we can become gods, whether little g or big g? Sorry to my Mormon friends. Um, nowhere in scripture. This is a misquotation of John chapter 10 in which he quotes, um, and also John taking this from Psalm chapter 82. The context of Psalm chapter 82 is in what we call an imprecatory psalm. This is David writing against those that, whether religious or leaders, that think that they are gods because of their power and influence. And David is writing this as a uh, treaty against them. Not as though that this was a reality, that he is bringing out the heart of these men and the reality of their wickedness. Psalm 82, verses 6 and 7 actually says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. The true context of this passage is, you are sons of the Most High. You may claim that you are little gods, G, but you will die. You're not going to um, somehow be eternal in the fact of God's eternal being past, present, and future. Unless you are found in Christ, of course. But like men, like princes, like those in authority, you will die. Period. Well, you're right, Ron. Um, they never get the they never list where they get their doctrines from. Although she quite often quotes Kenneth Hagin and and others, um, whether positively or negatively. Yeah, the context kind of gets in the way, huh, Doctor Howard? Once again, it's a eisegesis is in taking of three words of Psalm eighty two. And misquoting John, actually Jesus and John 10, to then apply it to herself. Doesn't Isaiah chapter 44 say that I alone am God and besides me there is none other? I know none? 
And God, if he is truly God, is omniscient and knows all things, omnipresent and is everywhere. How is it? Shirkbe uhaha, good to see ya. And yet, how is it that God could have lied in in Isaiah forty four when he says that I alone am God, besides me there is none other? And then how can you eisegete this passage and, and then claim that we are the God kind just because he created us? This once again feeds into a couple of other doctrines that we're going to see here in a moment, specifically extra biblical revelation that is nowhere apart out of the outside of the New Testament. Outside of the closing of the canon of scripture, we do not see anybody with who is a quote unquote prophet, because even Jesus said that the prophets were until John. Yes, we'd see some prophecy happening in the early portions of the New Testament, but we do not see it being a normative for the remainder of the church age. And it was always guarded by the scriptures, as we already looked at in my presentation on false teachers, Leviticus um, chapters 13 and 18. This idea that we are somehow little gods leads to a doctrine of, well, if we're little G gods, then can't, who's to say that we can't be big G gods? This also goes into um, her teaching about the power of our words, displays her theology of man. Her theology is very anthropocentric and not theoprocentric, God. Yes, uh, you're right, Ron. Uh, Exodus 4 and 7 um, are often misquoted about the men of God approaching um, unsaved, unregenerate heathen and calling out their sin in believing that they are quote-unquote gods. We see that in Exodus chapter 4. We see that in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 in the prophets dealing with Satan, but also the, the king in which is the earthly representation of, of Satan and being used by him in their kingdoms. And Jesus there in John chapter 10 and David's imprecatory psalm we saw in Psalm chapter 82. This next one was rather difficult to swallow. I'm going to read the quotation and then I will play the clip. Joyce Myers claims that she is not a sinner. We would call this uh, sinless perfection, which is not a biblical doctrine. It can't be found anywhere in the New Testament. And we're going to look at several passages that refute this. She says, I'm not poor, I'm not miserable, and I'm not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my thick head that I wasn't a sinner anymore. And the religious world thinks that's heresy, and it is, and they want to hang you for it, and I do. But the Bible says that I am righteous, and I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. Um, hold on. One moment. Um, Romans chapter 7. Hey, Jonathan, good to see you. Welcome for joining us. Didn't Paul write an entire chapter about dealing with this body of death in which we live in and the dealing of the struggles between our sin and our righteousness that is only found in Christ and that is not ourselves? See, if you are righteous in and of yourself by your own works, then that, that would be true. It's an either or proposition that if it is according to your own works, that then you are righteous, then you can't be a sinner and righteous at the same time. But because Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, covers us, it has yet to deal with the body of death in which we live in. That is why 
Paul wrote Romans chapter 7 to deal with the, that internal struggle that we are going to deal with until either we pass away or in the presence of the Lord or until he returns. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Once again, John dealing with the teachings of Serethius and the early Gnostics about the nature of sin and claiming that we can be perfect and the separation of the spiritual and the body, a, a form of dualism that was present in Jesus's time, but also was resurrected in a way with Serethius and those that John was dealing in, in 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If, if I were to stand before you here today and say, Chris hasn't sinned today, I would be a liar. And the truth wouldn't be in me. John's dealing here for the first two chapters about if, you, if the light is truly in you, if the foss of life, if the one who said, let there be light and there was light is the one that has redeemed you, then you have to realize that you were a sinner in need of a savior, but you still sin. If we say that we magically, of our own will and volition, no longer sin, we are liars. And so I can easily now say, between the quote we're going to listen to from Joyce Myers and the text copy of what's been said, quote John and say, she's a liar. The truth is not in her because she lies to the fact that that she says that she is sinlessly perfected. My term, not hers. In fact, let us go to her quotation of this. I am not poor, I am not miserable, and I am not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my sick head. I wasn't a sinner anymore. And the religious world thinks that's heresy, and they want to hang you for it. But the Bible says that I'm righteous, and I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. Yes, you can, Joyce Myers. You can be a sinner and declared righteous, not internally righteous, at the same time. That is the difference in which we are talking about. Once again, this shows an anthropocentric, man-centered theology versus a God and Scripture-centered, sola scriptura-based faith. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Romans chapter 7, Paul says, Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh or my body. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells in me. The Spirit is given to all those that are found in Christ. As a down payment and a seal of our future redemption of our bodies, it still does not mean that Chris doesn't have to deal with this flesh with the sin that so easily ensnares and entraps us. Yes, I live life for Christ, but do I still sin? Yes. And if I say that I do not sin, I am a liar. There, there's no running around. There's no mental gymnastics that you can do to get away from the clear teaching of Scripture. That is why Paul can easily say in Romans chapter 7, seven, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Because according to James, the end result of sin is death. According to 
Paul, Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6. Sin equals death. Separation from God. That is why Paul can be thankful to be born twice and to die once. Or born twice and to die once rather than to be born once and die twice. That is the great hope of the Christian is to to realize that we will not die twice. Not die in this body and then die spiritually being judged by God. That is not the case in the New Testament at all. Joyce Myers, you are a sinner today just as where you were yesterday and just as you will be tomorrow. Just as I am a sinner yesterday, I am a sinner today and I will be a sinner tomorrow until Christ returns and redeems this body of death for a body of eternal life. I also want to look at Joyce Myers and her receiving of special, what we would call revelation. The quotation, which I will read and which we will hear in just a moment, is this. The Bible can't even find a way to explain this. Not really. That is why you have to get it by revelation. There are no words to explain what I'm telling you. I have just got to trust God that he is putting into your spirit like he is putting it into mine. This is, by definition, extra biblical revelation. And yet, it must be tested by the word of God itself. She is saying that the Bible can't explain something. If the Bible can't explain something, then it's not theonustos, God breathed. That it is not the inspired verbal plenary uh, scripture, which is able to lead us unto life and life eternal. If we have to continually receive special revelation in order to understand the Bible, then the the canon is not closed and we need to add the book of Joyce Myers to the back of the Bible. Let us take a, a listen to her actually saying this. can't even find any way to explain this. Not really. That's why you've got to get it by revelation. There are no words to explain what I'm telling you. I've got to just trust God that he's putting it into your spirit like he put it into mine. God taught me. Once again, she's directly claiming to receive special revelation from God apart from the scripture. As we looked at a few days ago in presentation, it is must be according to the scripture. And what special revelation has she received? Things like she is no longer a sinner, that Jesus suffered for our sins in hell, and in a minute that our words are so powerful that we can call into things into existence that aren't. Uh, Folks, family, friends, where is this in Scripture? Yeah, if if the Bible can't explain something, neither can she. You're right, Dr. Howard. Um, It's... It's really difficult to listen to these things because it is not found anywhere in the text of the New Testament. Neither should it be accepted and... Uh, I really wish in some ways there was a universal um, truth of the church in which teachers like of the Bible, like myself, get together and, and basically anathematize and call to the table Joyce Myers for her heresy and call her to repentance. See, that's the biblical thing to do. If you want to start quoting scripture, let's look at Matthew 7, 7 and 17. And look at the fact that we need to call people to repentance. As we looked at Peter the last time, it says, only put up with these people once or twice, and then if not, ignore them. I know that Hank Hanegraaff has um, 
rebuked her openly on his television program. I know that Matt Slick on Karm.org has documented her heresies, and she has yet to make a response. She has been called on the carpet, just as at the end of this presentation, I will call her to the carpet and ask for her repentance. Not only the fact that she's usurping authority over a man, but her teachings have been proven to be flat out heresy. Now, whether it's what we would call damnable heresy, enough to put her into the pit of hell because of her teachings, I'm going to leave that between her and God. All I can do is present to you today that it is false teaching, what we would call heresy, that may lead people to another Christ, not the Christ in which we received, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in which we are able then to be saved. If it is a different Christ, then there is no salvation in that other Christ. As our Roman Catholic friends would say, an alter alter Christus, another Christ. Next thing I want to look at um, as we're getting close to the end, so for those of you that have been watching for the last hour or so, yeah, no, I hear you, Dr. Howard, Second Peter and Jude, I'm right behind you. The next teaching that I want to look at as we get to the end of this presentation is her saying that we as Christians can call things into existence out of nothing. The, the fancy term is ex nihilo. That literally we can take um, and to create realities, substance, being, whether it be healings or money or prosperity or health into being out of nothing by our own very words. Now, yeah, she will. Hey, Jim Anderson, good to see you. She will say, oh, but then you really need to, to claim the, the scriptures. But it's covering up, it's muddying the waters in the fact that she's claiming that we as Christians in and of ourselves can create things out of nothing. In the quotation of what you're going to hear in just a moment, she says, calling things not yet a reality in my life as though they already existed. Later on, she then goes to say, my words contain power. We're going to look at the scriptural evidence as to the true power of our words. But let's listen to her for a moment. by the Holy Spirit how to start confessing the Word of God out loud and calling things that were not yet a reality in my life as if they already existed. Now, just in case you're going to say, oh, don't tell me this is a name it, claim it message. The whole point is, is in Romans 4, 17, the Bible says that we serve a God who calls things that do not exist as if they already existed, and he speaks life to dead things, and they come back to life. So that's how powerful your words are. You can speak life into dead circumstances in your life, and you can see the resurrection of power of God in your life. Now, you can't just say anything you want to say and make it happen, but you can speak the Word of God out loud, and those words have power. You know, there's a scripture that says that angels hearken to the voice of God's Word. They don't listen to our complaining, but they have to listen to the Word of God. And we have angels that are assigned to us. You know you have guardian angels? We have angels assigned to us, and if you want them to work in your life, then you need to start agreeing with what God says and stop just saying any little thing that floats through your brain. <laughs> I'm getting some funny looks. It's like, you don't have any trouble complaining out loud. You don't have any trouble gossiping out loud. So why do we have such a hard time confessing the Word of God out loud? Well, because Satan doesn't want us to do it. You say, well, why do I have to confess it out loud? Because words contain power. What kind of a message, what kind of a meeting would this be today if you all came and I said, well, I'm not going to say anything. 
You know, you came because you wanted to hear what I was going to say. You wanted to hear what God was going to speak to you through me. And it's the words that are bringing the power of God to you. And when that, it renews your mind and then it gets down into your life and it begins to change things in your life. God's word contains power. There's power inherent in the word of God. So when you speak the word of God over your life or over your children's life or over their futures, one of the things that I started to say when my kids were all little was all of my children grow up and they marry born again, spirit filled men and women and they all serve God all their life. And you know, every one of my children are married to somebody that loves God. They're all in some way, shape or form serving God in ministry. That makes a lot more sense than saying, oh, I'm so afraid my kids are gonna fall away from God. I'm so afraid they're gonna marry the wrong person. I'm so afraid my kids are gonna get addicted to drugs. Let me tell you something, when you're tempted to say stuff like that, just ask God to help you zip your lip and instead of saying what you feel like saying, say what God's word says. Once again, this is what we would call positive confession and she's talking out both sides of her mouth. You guys noticed that at the beginning of her presentation? At first she starts saying, well, it's you that has the power and you can claim things into being in your life and you can call dead things to life. And then she says, well, then God can do that. Which is it, Joyce Myers? It's either God can call things into existence that are not including things in your life or is it you that can call things into being? This is new age nonsense. This is the power of confession and the power of positive thinking and that and words are containers for power in which he writes about is all new age nonsense. It, I don't have a slide for this because I just thought of it, but something Paul talks to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. See, Paul says, here is the, the real power that is behind the words contained in Scripture. Don't take Yes, you, you are right in talking about Tetzel and indulgences. Many of, of this same type of theology shows up in uh, the Dark Ages in Roman Catholicism that then give light to indulgences, um, plenary indulgences, and the, the priestly role, quote-unquote, of the forgiveness of sins in the Roman Catholic Church. But we'll deal with that in another, other presentations on the Roman Catholic Church. But Paul tells Timothy the very power of the words of God are for what? Is it to call things into being that aren't into being in your life? Is it in claiming, naming and claiming it for your children or for a house or for health? No. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And how from childhood do you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? That is the point of the scriptures, to point to the fact we are sinners in need of a savior to bring us to Christ. That is the purpose of the scriptures, not to name it and claim it, not to call things into being that aren't a current reality, to uh, positively confess, oh no, you're not distracting me at all, Ron. The, the whole purpose of this live broadcast is so we can interact with those, the, the 10 people that are watching right now, so that we can get a better conversation going for those that are going to watch after this, that as this goes on YouTube and we have discussions there. So Paul says the reason in Timothy's life for the scriptures being in his life is to lead him to salvation. Not for him to claim the scriptures as to cre create ex nihilio out of nothing. 
No, he says, in fact, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Not equipped to have your best life now. Not equipped to uh, speak things into being that aren't. No, instead, it is to bring us to Christ and be able to serve him not to serve ourselves. Once again, this goes back to being, are we anthropocentric, man-centric in the gospel and in the scriptures, or are we God-centered in seeing God's purposes and plans in and through the scriptures? As Dr. White would say, this is the dividing line. It's either about man or it is about God's plans and purposes that include man. Which is it? In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus has strong words about this idea. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. We know from scripture that, in fact, where did those verses go? Well, I'm not seeing, hey, Pastor Eddie, good to see you. Yeah, you're you're right, Dr. Howard. Why can't they speak all the money that they keep begging for uh, in their presentations? You know, if they can, uh, uh, out of ex nihilio, out of nothing, call things into being, then why don't they just call for a bazillion dollars? And as Ron says, if words really did have such power, then we'd be overrun with elves and unicorns. Because then if words really had power, then the Lord of the Rings would be a reality. And so would the Chronicles of Narnia. Yes, words have power to both build up and to tear down, according to Proverbs. Yes, they can hurt people, but they cannot call things into being out of nothing. That is only a trait in which God can do. Once again, going back to her theology that we are little gods. If we are little gods, then we have the same attributes of God, and one of them is being a creator and being able to create things out of nothing by his very word. But as we already looked at, we are not little gods. We are the creation who worships the creator, not the other way around. Joyce Myers is going to be held accountable for every careless word that she has spoken, whether it is on the nature of salvation, of whether it is was accomplished in hell, whether Jesus needed be, to be the first born again man, another heresy, whether it is uh, she her receiving extra special revelation apart from the scriptures, whether her denial of being a sinner, all of these are heresies in which she has propagated in writing and in video and through her quote unquote ministry. Now, we haven't even touched the uh, just the denial of Scripture's authority on the role of the elder and the, aka the pastor, bishop, or teacher in the church. Hey, Christy Lamb and Tobin Beach, glad you could join us. We're just actually wrapping up. So, this will actually go on my Facebook page as a video, an hour and a half or so video on the teachings of Joyce Myers and why she is what we would call a heretic, teaching falsely and leading many people astray because it is not her. some of her teachings are not found in the scriptures. Now, are some of the things she says true? Yes. But we are to be Bereans and to sort through what is being presented to us to see whether it's found in scripture or not. See, Satan himself can quote scripture. As we looked at last time, Satan and his and his minions, shall we say, can even parade as angels of light. They can quote the scripture just as much as you can or I can. Hence the temptation of Jesus in the desert in which Satan quoted scripture, twisted it, but he quoted it. 
Just as many false teachers on TV can quote the scriptures and read the scriptures all they want, but the truth is in the pudding, is in what they believe about the nature of the atonement, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. What Jesus are they presenting to you? Is it a man who then became God, who then suffered in hell for your sins, and then became the first born again man? That heresy has been refuted, starting with Serethius by John in the early centuries, and condemned um, through the teachings of Arius at the early church councils and refuted as we have seen in the scripture today. Hey John, good to see you. Once again, just as the early heresies of the early church, the writers in the early church had to deal with the heresies that came up just as I am dealing with the heresies that are in our century. Paul had to deal with the Judaizers adding to the gospel through saying you have to hold the Old Testament uh, circumcision and laws in order to be a true Christian. John had to deal with Serethius and his proto-Gnostic teachings. Uh, Athanasius had to fight against Arian, who believed that uh, a form of dualism and that Jesus wasn't fully God and fully man, and that's why at the early church councils, they came up with the Greek term homoousius, of the same substance as the Father, rather than being of a different substance. Tertullian had to fight Sabellianism, what we would now call today modalism, that God chooses to be, become the Son at some point, and then chooses to become the Spirit, and then flip back to being the Father. Augustine had to fight against Pelagius in the nature of sin, whether we are morally just neutral and are, and are good and bad balance out in the end, or are we, as Paul says in Romans, dead in trespasses and sin and me being made, needing to be made alive in Christ. Or as Luther in his dealing with his 95 Thesis and the teachings of Rome on things like purgatory, the atonement, communion, and others. Just as today, we need to identify the heresies of Rome, the idolatry that comes in and through the presentation of Mass and the calling of Jesus down and re-crucifying him every time the Mass is presented, and that his sacrifice on the cross only makes salvation possible, but you need to add works to it. Not only that, the idolatry of Mary and making her co-redemptrix and a co-mediator with Christ. Modern Gnosticism, quote-unquote secret teachings, or in many... Oh, very interesting, Michael. You're only seven minutes away from the Catholic Church there in Wittenberg. Man, that would be an, an interesting journey. Now, I will say that the reformers did not go far enough. We will have a presentation and discussion maybe with Dr. Howard or uh, Pastor X or others about how the, the Reformation didn't go far enough. They were still caught in um, the traditions of the church in which Martin Luther still continued his view of communion and infant baptism. Um, also, they're, they were state-run churches. The, er, the Reformation did not go far enough. Yes, they touted Semper Reformanda, always reforming, but somehow it kind of stopped after John Calvin. That we need to continually reform our view to adhere to the scriptures, sola scriptura, and tota scriptura, all of scripture, rather than the teachings of men in which we have seen in Joyce Myers. Arianism pops its ugly head again today in the teaching of Joyce Myers that Jesus was the first born again man. A firm denial of the very nature of Christ and him being a part of the Godhead. Um, and Pelagian theology is rearing its ugly head once again in Joyce Myers' teaching that uh, you are somehow in and of yourself become sinless and you are no longer a sinner. She makes Paul a liar, not only in, 
in Romans 3, in Romans 6, and in Romans 7. We are dead in Christ. We can do nothing. Just as Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, that Lazarus had no power to resurrect himself, just the same way the sinner is unable to come to God unless God calls him. We will deal with in the future the nature of salvation, that it is not anthropocentric, man-centered. It is theopocentric, God-centered, according to his works, his purposes, and his power, not mine or not any man's. Pelagian theology was on display today in the presentation of um, a different Jesus. A Jesus that only makes salvation possible, but then somehow we have to add our works and our goodness to it. In this series, we are going to be covering so many false teachers. We This was just a short view of, well, if an hour and 35 minutes is a short view of Joyce Meyer's teachings that contradict the scriptures. Earnestly, if Joyce Myers or one of her associates or her ministry watches this video, I call you to repentance. I'm calling you on the table just as other people have, but I'm praying and hoping that you will. See, this purpose isn't just to bash Joyce Myers, it's to call her to repentance according to Matthew chapter 7 and 17, to approach someone one by one. Well, um, Matt Slick of CARM.org, um, CRI has also sent their presentations to her ministry to call her to repentance, and she has not. I must then follow along, just as in Scripture we see that you must approach someone one-on-one, -on -one, and if they do not repent, then you bring two elders along with you. Well, we've already gone beyond that. More than two elders, pastors, or teachers in the church have rebuked her teaching openly, and she has yet to repent and to confess her sin. And so I am doing that today. That is why we need to present her before the whole church, according to Matthew 7 and 17, to then say, if you do not repent, you are not of us. If you want to look at the scriptural evidence for this, look at my three-hour presentation on calling out false teachers. We must, as the body of Christ, give them opportunities to repent. And I pray that she does before Christ returns or she's going to find herself in hot water. But she has been rebuked time and time and time again, just as we represented here today. So since she will not repent, now we bring it before the church body and say, do not listen to her, period. She is a wolf in sheep's clothing. She is teaching doctrines contrary to Christ and to the gospel in which you have received. I pray that those of you who watch this that are in the two churches in which I pastor, avoid her. Avoid her as, with as much as you possibly can and instead look to the scriptures for truth, not in Joyce Myers. This is going to be the same calling that I give at every presentation, whether we talk about Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, um, Bill Johnson, and others, calling them to the carpet and asking for them to repent. And then it is upon us as the church to bring them back into the fold through a process of restoration. But that process of restoration cannot happen until they repent. Just as if there was a brother sinning in my church or a sister in which I went to them privately and confronted them about their sin. If they didn't repent, I would bring another elder or one of our, the deacons along with me and have another conversation. If they then still choose not to repent, I must bring them in front of the entire congregation and say, here is the sin. This is why it is unbiblical. This is why this person needs to repent. If they do not repent, we need to then say, you are not of us. 
just as Joyce Myers is not of us until she repents. And I would say really believes the gospel, not the gospel that she has presented. The other Jesus that is just a man who needed to be born again, who needed to suffer in hell for his, for our sins. That her, she needs to repent of teaching that we are little gods and that we have the same powers of God to call things into being ex nihilio out of nothing. There is many other audio clips and teachings in which I could have presented. This was just a portion of gross error and sin on her part. Joyce Myers, if you watch this or hear this, or if it is passed along to you, repent and believe. As a pastor, one that is entrusted with the gospel and protecting my flock, I'm calling my flock to avoid you and to mark you out, according to Romans chapter 16. Why am I so strong on this? Because people in my church, people in my community are being led astray by this teaching. Hey, Juan Serrano, Kempo buddy. Um, People in my congregation, in my community, are being led astray by her teaching. I am called, according to Romans 16 and a number of other passages that we've already looked at the last presentation, to rebuke her openly and to separate her, to mark her out, according to the King James Version of Romans chapter 16. We are doing that today. If you are a Christian true Christian, who believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and are trying to follow him and his word, you need to avoid false teachers like Joyce Myers. Don't listen to her. Don't buy her books. Don't watch her live streams. Don't um, listen to her 30-part CD series on whatever. Avoid her. It is for your benefit that I am saying these things, not for mine. This teaching is not to puff up Chris or Dr. Howard or any other biblical teacher. The point is to expose those that are wolves in sheep's clothing, leading people astray to their own slaughter. Because she presents a different Jesus and a different gospel that people could believe in And then when Christ comes, be found not in him. That is the pastoral concern that is presented before you today. That people could follow this gospel of being little gods and speaking into power. Could lead people to the point of receiving a different gospel that does not save. Just as we are to rebuke openly Those that preach another gospel, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and the Roman Catholic Church, we are to present the true gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us the gospel very succinctly. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the God-man, who is homoousius of the same substance of the Father, fully God and fully man what we would call the hypostatic union, big fancy theological terms. That is the gospel you need to believe in, that Joyce Myers needs to believe in. Not that somehow she is no longer a sinner and adds to her own salvation by her good works. Instead, she needs to believe on the only name in which man can be saved, and that is Christ Jesus. These words may come off as strong, and that is on purpose. Not because Chris is anything special. Chris is a sinner in need of a savior just as everyone. But because we serve such a great God, we must call out the darkness for what it is. Just as John tells us in 1 John that the light is in us and it dispels the darkness. The foss, the very light in which God created at the very beginning is in us. Are we to hide it under a bushel? No. We are to display it as a lighthouse for all to see. And that lighthouse is going to dispel the darkness contained in the teachings of Joyce Myers and Joel Osteen 
and T.D. Jakes. And the list can go on and on and on. I could spend the rest of my ministry years pointing out the errors of these false teachings, but ultimately it has to come back to what is old is new again. The same false teachings of Satan in the garden and presentation uh, and temptation of Jesus in the desert are the same ones today. Constantly adding to or taking away from the gospel itself, whether it's Judaizers, Serethius, Arianism, Sabellianism, Pelagian theology, or the theology of Rome, we must rebuke it. I encourage you, if you are a pastor or a teacher, or if you teach a Sunday school, teaching our children the way that they should go so that they not, would not depart from it, avoid Joyce Myers, period. Have a bonfire with her books, as I did. I found some of her books here at the church. You know what happened with them? Because they contain the heresies in which we've looked at. My prayer and hope is that you will avoid her and that you will cling to the gospel as contained in the scriptures. Don't lean unto your own understanding. Don't lean into your own intuition or uh, discernment, but instead look to the scriptures that lead you to Christ. That is my heart today. That is why I did this presentation. There will be continued dialogue and discussion, whether on Facebook or YouTube as this video goes up. But please be found in Christ rather than being found in the gospel according to Joyce Myers. With that, I will call it an evening. Thank you for this opportunity to look at these false teachings, and we will be looking at more. Uh, God willing, tomorrow we will be talking about baptism and the false teachings of Lutheranism and the Catholic Church regarding baptism. Um, baptismal regeneration, and looking at the scriptures. Thanks, Sheldon. Good to see you in the last, and the six people that are, that are still watching. Um, and for all those that will watch after this, thank you for sticking around for almost two hours to hear my heart on the issue and to hear what the scriptures truly say, because that's really what we should be concerned with. With that, I will leave you all. You guys have a blessed evening or morning or whenever you're watching this. And may God call you to himself. Bye now.